Coming up on Tech News today, the Federal Trade Commission has shut down some scammers, but they're still trying to fool Ars Technica. Not a good target, guys. Also, Facebook dings 1 billion active users, and Microsoft might buy Ardeo. Maybe we'll buy them at the A. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Thursday, October 4th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by the new Squarespace. Squarespace introduces a new content management system, making it faster and easier to create a high-quality website, blog, or online portfolio, plus more than 50 new features, including mobile responsive designs. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase, go to squarespace.com and use offer code TNT10. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your iPhone, iPad, MacBook, or Android smartphone. Find out what your gadget is worth and get cash to upgrade to the latest iPhone at gazelle.com. And by Ring Central. We do everything in the cloud. That's why we love our cloud-based phone system by Ring Central. Zero startup costs, and Ring Central is $20 a month per user. Try it now with a 30-day risk-free trial and buy one desk phone and get a second one free up to 20 phones. Call 800-543-9980 or visit ringcentral.com and use our promo code TWIT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zaktar. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we try to keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world, starting each time with the top 10 stories of the day in the news feuds. Mark Zuckerberg just punched 1 billion people in the face. Why would he do that? Wait, uh, no, hit 1 billion active users. That means 1 billion users actively use the social network oh, each month. Okay. I misread. Uh, Facebook reached the milestone back on September 14th at 1245, but the thank you blog post just went up today. And Facebook's not getting any younger. Wait, no, yep, it is getting younger. Median age fell from 23 to 22 since July 2010. Sources tell Bloomberg that AT&T will carry the Lumia 920 in the U.S. AT&T will immediately sell the Windows Phone 8-based device, the sources say, but it will be made available to its customers sooner rather than later. In vague news views. <laughs> <laughs> the Federal Trade Commission won a court order in the Southern District of New York to stop international phone scams selling scareware. In the scams, people would call posing as computer technicians and sell their victims antivirus services that they probably didn't need. The court also froze $180,000 of the defendant's assets. The FTC went after 17 individuals and 15 companies. Ladies, gentlemen, and undeclared, another long national nightmare is over. Good. Google and a trade group representing U.S. book publishers today announced they have settled their book scanning copyright dispute. When this dispute started, I worked at CNET. Buzz Out Loud did a number of episodes, and Veronica Belmont barely talked on podcasts. Now you can't shut her up. Google Library Project will receive access to publishers in copyright books, and U.S. publishers can choose which ones Google can use. It announced plans to spin off its digital Nook business earlier this year, and now Barnes & Noble is sharing the details of the partnership. Nook Media LLC is the newly formed Barnes & Noble subsidiary responsible for digital reading and education markets. The Microsoft and Barnes & Noble partnership includes a $300 million investment from Microsoft with plans for a Windows 8 reading app. Google will be cutting more jobs in the third quarter at its Motorola division. The company said that its charges related to severance pay will be higher by 9% uh, compared to its previous estimates. Back in August, Google said it would cut 20% of Motorola's workforce as it restructures Motorola to try to make money. YouTube has decided to make the U.S. Digital Millennium Copyright Act procedure part of its official takedown process. Previously, YouTube followed the general outlines of the takedown process, but operated it internally, leaving users whose videos were taken down mistakenly little recourse. Now copyright holders who wish to force a video down must file an actual DMCA complaint and risk the legal ramifications of false takedown notices. The Next Web reports rumors from European sources that Microsoft is in talks to acquire San Francisco-based digital music streaming, subscription, and discovery service, Rdio. Microsoft operates the Xbox Entertainment brand and is planning to introduce a new free ad-supported music streaming service called Xbox Music. So would Rdio's established streaming model be a good fit here? We're going to speculate later on the show because again, this is just a rumor. 
Nobody's been crying for map alternatives on Android lately, but so what? You got one. TomTom's coming to Android 2.2 and higher for devices with particular screen resolutions. Uh, essential features like spoken turn-by-turn -turn directions in multiple languages, speed camera notifications, HD traffic routing, and lifetime map updates are coming your way. Prices vary, but U.S. and Canada and Western Europe editions are priced right now at 50 bucks uh, and available in the Google Play Store today. Thanks for the TomTom Tom update, Tom. You're all if, you missed eyes, the, eyes. if you missed the presidential debates live, you probably caught it on Twitter. Twitter said that there were more than 10 million tweets last night and called it the most tweeted about event in U.S. politics. Popular discussions on Twitter included Big Bird, Medicare, <laughs> and President Obama's five seconds remark. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by the new Squarespace.com. Now faster and easier than ever to create a high-quality website, a blog, online portfolio. They're great at photo management if you're looking for a way to do that. Try out the new content management system. It was It's meant to f make it even easier to use, beautiful design, and giving you the best customer support built on HTML5, CSS3, JavaScript, and JSON for speed and flexibility. Uh, when you add an image to your site, they automatically resize it in seven different versions so that the correct size loads for the device. Your site looks professionally designed no matter how it's viewed. And they still have beautiful templates. In fact, even, even better templates. 100% drag and drop functionality for all your customization tools. New page builder tool called the Layout Engine lets you customize pages in just a few seconds. You just add the blocks of content, move the photos around, videos, text, social media content, whatever you got. Preview the layout as you go, making it even easier to build a website. Uh, you can automatically pull photos from Instagram into your site, instantly sync pages and galleries to Facebook, auto-publish new blog entries on Twitter. So many social aspects of this that they've added. you got to go try it out. If you haven't tried Squarespace, go do it now. Don't say, oh, well, I don't want to have to give them a bunch of information. You have to virtually give them no information. Just name the blog. You don't have to give them a credit card or anything like that. Try it out. If you do like it and you want to pay for the service, use offer code TNT10 and you'll get 10% off your purchase on new accounts. Now, if you pay for monthly, you'll get 10% off the first month. If you pay for it yearly, you'll actually get 10% off the entire year. And don't forget, with a year subscription, you get a free domain name. So go to squarespace.com, try it out. And don't forget, if you do try, uh, try it out and like it and want to purchase it, use that offer code TNT10. And we thank Squarespace for their support of Tech News Today. All right, let's bring in our guest for today's show, Mr. Martin Giles, U.S. technology correspondent from The Economist. Uh, I'm a big fan of, uh, of your appearances on the Babbage podcast as well as your work over there. Welcome back to the show, Martin. Thank you very much for having me. Great to have you along. Uh, as we celebrate one billion active users, they're not sitting around. They're not... They're doing stuff on Facebook. Resting on their or likes. Or at least they're using Facebook to connect on other third-party services, because that's also an so active user. So I'm an active user. user because I've checked it once this month. Yeah. So I count. Yeah, All right. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. You but count, but still, a, bil a billion users that can be called active within a 30-day period is a huge milestone. It's something that Facebook has been working toward for a while. Um, and the day has come, and Facebook's celebrating in a, hey, let's just keep our, you know the status quo going because we're all um, a culture of engineers. Uh, this is uh, according to Mark Zuckerberg, who spoke to uh, Bloomberg and gave some really interesting um, insight into what this means for the company, what happens now, they're at a billion users. Obviously, it's not like uh, mission accomplished. Uh, the, company, the company moves forward. Interesting statistic. Uh, Zuckerberg says around now of 1,000 engineers... Um, who work for the company now have to uh, basically make a, a billion people happy. So each engineer is responsible for around a million people. Get them coffee, <laughs> rub their feet. <laughs> thank goodness, thank goodness. This is a this is a this is a virtual <laughs> virtual bidding. But that's a, that's crazy. Uh, he says this is not the sort of thing that you could get as an engineer at any other company. He says who who else even has a billion? customers coca-cola mcdonald's yeah the bloomberg reporter had said perhaps microsoft suck said yeah maybe <laughs> maybe them Apple. too maybe them too but right. again it's you know it's a social network so things are different um he says what was interesting about the celebration of a billion user is like they did have a countdown that they were watching but he says it's not even really accurate i mean when you are doing data analytics at the scale of a billion people, you have to use a sample. So we're sitting around watching the billion users, the numbers going up. 
but it's really just a sample. It's not actually sort of an accurate representation of one billion happen right now. We wouldn't be it's able to find that person, okay. even if we were going to, you know, give them a balloon and a bunch of Facebook gifts. So or one billionth like person that. just went active. Right. Yeah, they find can them. That. All right. Find that man or woman or child. Um, and then he talked a little bit about the idea of building internally versus externally. Um, he says, even when we were at half a billion people, you get large scale services like Skype or Netflix. They have big user bases too, but they're not at the point where the majority of their users are also Facebook users. So companies couldn't necessarily rely on Facebook as a piece of infrastructure for registration. He says a lot of startups have been doing this for a long time, but not the big companies. Now we're at the point where as long as they want to, they can. You know, we're at a billion users. We know a lot about these folks, a Skype, a Netflix, or another company who wants to integrate uh, Facebook data into their product can do that, and it's, it's going to be beneficial to them. Um, he says on building internally, there's a whole vision around the news feed. You know, right now, I, I feel like it's exactly what he says it shouldn't be. He says it shouldn't just be a list of posts that your friends are making. I still feel like, although I know the news feed is weighted based on people that I think are more important versus people that are just casual acquaintances, it still does feel like a bunch of posts. He says what we want is for it to be kind of a living, breathing newspaper. So at some point as we kind of figure out who is connected and how, it'll be a better map of how you can navigate the larger web um, than the traditional link structure of the web. So, okay, that's an internal long-term uh, goal. Um, and then he also says uh, long-term Chinese market, still a priority, but... Yeah, they got to a billion active users without China. Sure. That's, that's a lot of people left out. Well, without officially being in China. Well, yeah. Get right. some numbers from China, sure, sure. but but certainly not on the scale that it would be if it was just open in China. So, yeah, I mean, he, he uh, acknowledges that that's complicated. That's not something that they're going to figure out in the short term at all. And there's really no, no roadmap um, that he laid out for that. Um, also mentioned, yes, the stock offering was disappointed. Obviously, we care about our investors. Didn't really say anything we haven't yeah, already he heard. He's got control of the company. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what's he going to say? <laughs> thought, it was great. Martin, I thought it was quite interesting. There was, a, there was a stat in there that um, they were saying that it had, I think, about 265 billion photos uploaded to, to Facebook um, since it's been founded. And that currently it had about 219 billion on its servers. So that there's sort of like about 40 billion that have gone, 40 odd billion gone somewhat, somewhere. I guess that's, um, you know, uh, a, a lot of deleted sort of nights, uh, mornings of the nights <laughs> after. It's like, oh my God, did I really put that on Facebook? Let's get it off. Of course, they never really disappear. As we know, they are always there somewhere. That's how they can count them. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Exactly, Tom. Good spot. He also mentions when asked, okay, you've gotten to 1 billion. How are you going to get to 2 billion? Um, he says, listen, there's 5 billion people in the world. He's like, man, I just got to a billion. Yeah, give me a break. Yeah. Hey, they're a publicly traded company yeah, now. That's right. Scale, scale, scale. 1 billion isn't good enough. He says there's 5 billion people in the world who have phones. And a billion people are using Facebook. There's 600 million people using Facebook on phones. So, hey, that's that's our target market. Maybe Facebook, and that makes sense. Facebook needs to go out after the offline market, like actually print out these news feeds, give them to people, because mobile is only 600 million right now. They're only at a billion people. How else could they do it? Maybe just throw it out of a well, blimp? Well, they'll target the people who have phones but might not be using Facebook yet. It's 5 billion of them. How is that possible at this point? Like, I mean, the thing is, Facebook, they seem like they have, I mean... They continue to grow, and the median age keeps dropping. Like, when they first start off, actually, it starts off in 19 because they were pretty closed off. 26, then 26, then 23. Mm -hmm. Now it's 22. So the thing is, are they going to keep going after younger and younger people? Are they going to push for laws to be changed in the United States so they can have people, like, at, under a certain age? Because yeah, they are. They are, they are trying to it's do been that. But, but I have already got some. I mean, they're already on there. We know there are lots and lots of young Americans and others using basically like. I mean, there's no way of telling. So there are millions of, I suspect, in that uh, billion, there are a fair few million of, of under-13s on there. So somehow they've got to deal with this problem that they've got. Which is why when we hear what the median age on Facebook is, it's like, well, uh, of it? users yeah. who are telling the truth, I'm I mean, it's probably a lot younger. Yeah. Exactly. 
Yeah, no Chinese or under thirteen year olds. You know, Facebook, the Facebook gifts. <laughs> under thirteen year old Chinese, well, way out. <laughs> <laughs> That's your target market. Two billion. That's what you want. You better, better go out over the thirteen year olds in China. Um, the Facebook gifts that was announced last week. Um, it was, it's kind of funny. I mean, obviously, that's that's a potential huge moneymaker for Facebook. It doesn't really have anything to do with getting more users, but it certainly has to do with being able to monetize off the users they already have. A uh, reporter over at TechCrunch, Drew, Drew Olinoff, he said he uh, had bought his girlfriend something uh, using gifts, and it was like the package had a big Facebook brand mm -hmm. on it. And then you open it up, and there's another Facebook bag and, like, some Facebook promotional, I don't know, like a PR thing. And then there's the bonsai tree that he bought that had a little Facebook tag on it. It's like, ah! A lot of Facebook. Yeah, a lot of Facebook. They're, they're aggressively uh, part of the gift infrastructure if you decide to use that. All right, let's uh, move on to this rumor about Microsoft uh, being in talks to acquire Ardio, which is an online music service. And I was on vacation. We should go to the rumor mill, though, while we're at it. Why not? I was traveling. Why not go to the rumor mill when I come back? It's nice there. Yeah, I like it here. Yeah, the next web, was Sarah mentioned this, the next web's reporting that Microsoft's in talks to acquire Ardio. And not surprisingly, RDO and Microsoft didn't comment on the story. There, there's a shock. RDO, if you guys don't know, music streaming service, web interface. It also has a desktop mobile app. So it's got 18 million songs, founded by the same guys who founded Skype. And if you've forgotten, Microsoft bought Skype way back in 2011. Uh, RDO also has an international presence. It's available in the U.S., Canada, U.K., France, Germany, Brazil, and more. Uh, Skype's also an investor in RDO, so there's a lot of a lot of. Uh, so essentially, Microsoft already has money in RDO they because they have money in because they own Skype. Right. Uh, Microsoft does have its Zoom Music Pass. You know, that's ten dollars a month. Lots of music and uh, music videos. Fourteen million song selection there. Zoom right now though is limited to PCs, Windows Phone, and 360 Xbox 360. And the Verge is reporting that Xbox Music is going to hit at the same time as Windows 8. So October 26th, free ad supported version, also with subscription based services. That'll replace Zoom Pass to launch at the same time on Windows Phone, Windows 8, and the 360 with plans to go onto iOS and Android. And they have this really cool, apparently, SkyDrive integration. So if you want to have your playlists, you can have them all synced up. But would it make more sense for Microsoft to just keep pushing Xbox Music by rebranding Zoom Pass? Or should they go out and buy RDO, which already has a presence? Because Microsoft's done this thing where they have Link and they have Skype. They have like they will buy and acquire things that are very similar. So it's to enterprise there. and consumer in that case. Is this something that would make sense to have two consumer-based kinds of things? Well, okay. So my the short answer is no. Um, when I first read this story earlier, I was livid, and I told Ayaz, I was like, "This is the worst thing I've heard all week." <laughs> Microsoft cannot ruin RDO. I love RDO. I use it every Wait, single now, day. Why do you jump to the conclusion okay. that them buying RDO would all ruin right, it? All right, let there. me let me f let me get it out. Okay, so that was my first reaction: is hey, Microsoft will buy RDO and ruin the thing I love most in this world when it comes to streaming music services. But then the more I thought about it, the more I thought, I've, there's always been that little nagging voice in the back of my head, like, Spotify has so many more users. Spotify has, has more international users. Spotify has that uh, Facebook integration. RDO has it too, but Spotify has benefited a lot more from its relationship with Facebook and has a much larger user base. And I've always been a little worried that RDO was not long for this world. Um, it is a startup. It's based in San Francisco. It's got a great team, great design. The model works well but it doesn't have the numbers that a competitor like Spotify has. If Microsoft picks up RDO and says, you know what, screw the whole Zoom thing, like we'll just, or, or call it Zoom, fine, whatever, but we will roll the RDO model into the existing offering that we're about to uh, roll out to our huge consumer base. RDO lives and it is a good product and if Microsoft is smart, they don't change it all that much. RDO is available, like you said, mobile, desktop, on the web. I mean, you, you, you're covered pretty much. And then you get it on the Xbox and you've got like the home theater aspect to it. And I almost think that this could save RDO. I, th I think Sarah is absolutely right. I mean, I think that, that it, when I first saw it, I had exactly the same reaction. It was like shock, horror, oh no. And then when you really think about it, I mean, if you look what uh, Microsoft had done with Skype, I mean, I'm using Skype here. Yeah, they haven't ruined it. In fact, I mean, you, arguably, maybe they should have done more with it, but they certainly haven't sort of, um, you know, uh, corrupted the service or, or, or made it less attractive. Um, and I think that that is, it's a real opportunity for, for them to take a, a very, very successful uh, uh, 
arguably should be even more successful than it is, but a very, very um, high quality service and integrate it with the Xbox platform. And they're clearly out there looking for as many things as they can to, to sort of add to that platform. That's one of their, their two big plays in hardware out there right now. I, I, I am an RDO user myself, and I love it. I think it's great. It's a great way for music discovery, easy playlists. I like following other people's playlists. Uh, I don't jump to the conclusion that Microsoft would ruin it. I, I think they would expand it. And so I came to the conclusion that you did, Sarah, pretty quickly, which is if they're going to have an Xbox music service and they buy RDO to juice that, and it's Xbox or RDO or Xbox radio, I think they actually prefer that you call it radio, even though there's no A in the name, but nobody does. Uh, I, I think that would be a really good thing for the RDO users and for Microsoft. Mike, I remember when Microsoft bought Expedia back in the late 90s, and I'm like, that's it. I'm not using Expedia anymore, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, because I was just angry about Microsoft. I don't feel that way about what they do anymore because they don't seem to ruin the things that they buy always. Uh, they're not like Apple, and I'm not saying Apple ruins things, but Apple bought Lala. Uh, they just took La La yeah. and and ate it and subsumed it and got rid of the service. I don't I don't expect Microsoft would do that. If they did, I'd be upset though. With Microsoft's plans to rebrand Zune Pass into Xbox Music, it wouldn't surprise me at all that they were in talks with numerous companies to purchase them to see is it worthwhile to build our own, take our developers and send them off and make this product for iOS, Android, line, line up the international markets. Could we do that? What would that cost? What does audio cost? Because that's been around and it is you know you want to see if it's going to survive. It could be a very attractive move for RDO to go, oh, by the way, we could sell. Maybe we could, we could survive and we want to have products with a long-standing company that could make our service even better. I would think that they would they'd probably, I could see Microsoft, they would buy it and they'd keep them separate for a while because that's just something that they've been doing for a while. Mm -hmm. I would say it integrate in like two to three years. All right, let's talk about an FTC story, but don't don't run to the bathroom. Or yeah, it's much <laughs> okay. more exciting than it sounds. Uh, <laughs> the FTC has been cracking down on what's called scareware. Uh, they filed charges September 24th in Southern District of New York to stop a scareware company. They've frozen $180,000 of defendants' assets. They've been targeting 14 companies, 17 individuals. Uh, one of the cases getting the most attention today is a $163 million judgment in Maryland against Christy Ross, uh, the company founded by Sam, Jane, and Daniel Sundin called Innovative Marketing. Uh, the, this case has been running since 2008. Uh, they put out Things like WinFixer, Win Antivirus, and Win Antivirus Pro. And what all these things do uh, is try to scare you into paying the money. Uh, Ars Technica's Nate Anderson, shortly after they published the story about the $163 million judgment, got a call from one of these types of companies. And there's an excellent article accounting what happened as he frantically tried to like play out the thread to see what would happen. All he had was a Mac. So he call he get, IMs John Brodkin, who's probably in another office, uh, and is frantically getting John to launch a virtual machine of Windows so he can give the proper responses. As the guy guides him to Event Manager, which you can get by uh, right clicking on My Computer, and in Event Manager gets him to get a log, and in the log show brings up all of the errors that happen in the operating system. Now errors happen in the operating system all the time. It's you know it's not a big deal. So you actually are going to see errors on any machine, even the machine that's working properly. And that's what they do. They bring up all these error messages, and the error messages are scary. They've got big exclamation points and, and, and red stop signs. And then the company says, the, yes, yeah, these are all the viruses we detected. Uh, and so finally, Nate Anderson says, I'm call where are you, who are you with again? He's like, I'm calling from Windows. He's like, you're calling from Microsoft? It's like, oh, no, no, we're not Microsoft. We're Windows. <laughs> and we detected these viruses, and uh. we can help you get rid of them. And so what they'll do yeah. with unsuspecting people is say, give us your credit card information, and we'll sell you a fix. And if you don't give them the credit card information, they have tricked you farther along into actually giving them access, remote access to your machine, and then they shut down your Windows install and say, oh, see, we told you it was going to break. Oh man, this, I mean, it's a good thing this, these are getting these are getting taken down. But like, uh, I could just see people. I could imagine people going, "Why'd you pick up the phone in the first place? Why'd you take the call? Why are you even going over to your computer?" It's like the people that this happens to. Like this is this is what happens to like my mom, and I'm like, this is a bad thing. This is why I always have like sandbox machines for her, and like or like, but well, you don't have a Windows machine. How on earth did this happen? But it's good that this this is being cracked down on because it's just it's such a sleazy practice. And I've seen enough of these pop-ups show up on my Mac. And I'm like, wait a, wait a minute, that's not, I'm not using a Windows machine today. <laughs> How am I getting this Windows pop-up? <laughs> oh, right. 
<laughs> yeah, it's a, it, it's a despicable process, and, and probably most of the people in our audience are not going to fall for right, it. They go, credit card, come on, but I don't think you a lot, know better. Yeah, I don't think a lot of people realize how, how many people would fall for this. They think, oh, someone is, has detected a virus. Oh, look, there's the, there, there are these scary messages that I don't understand that must be true. Well, and That's what right. do you think I, to I think ask? Sorry, one of the other things that was quite striking about this case is that in some situations they were getting the, whoever was on the other end of the phone was getting remote access to the computers. You know, you down, they get the people to download software that would then allow them to access the computer from wherever they are hiding. And, and that's pretty frightening because then they're all over you. Yeah, well, I, I was actually, asto not astonished, but I thought it was pretty funny that Nate Anderson, who is deputy editor of Ars Technica, while he's getting John Brodkin to follow along, they get to the point where the guy on the phone wants him to install the software, and Nate's like, install it, install it. Brodkin's like, no way, I'm not installing that on my machine. He's like, for journalism, do it. No do way. It. So they finally called the bluff on the guy and said, look, we know you're not, yeah. you know, we know this is a scam. And he's like, no, it's not a scam. I am from Windows. Would you like to speak to my manager? They escalated it to a manager who tried to, to explain, oh, no, no, this is this is real. And the guy's like, no, it's not. I'm, I'm with Ars Technica. We, you know, and then the guy finally hung up on him. But uh, it's kind of amazing just how tenacious these mm. people are. I, they, they'll just, they figure, you know what, if, if we just keep pushing, eventually somebody will back off and say, oh, well, maybe maybe they are right. They seem very that insistent. That air of confidence will yeah. sell a lot of people, I think. Exactly, exactly. Uh, let's take a, a quick break and give you an air of confidence that you can sell your old gadgets easily at our sponsor, gazelle.com. Of course, this episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Gazelle. Uh, I just got my money from my iPhone. If, if you've been following the story over the past month, I locked in my quote 30 days ahead of time. I waited for the iPhone 5 to come out. I bought the iPhone 5, got it at home, activated it, put the other phone, the old phone in a box, sent it off, got my money. It, it, it can happen to you too. Uh, you don't have to have your new device. If you, if you want that new Samsung Galaxy S3, you don't have to, you don't have to wait uh, until you buy it, you can lock in the quote for your old iPhone, your old Android phone, your old MacBook if you want. Right now, just go to gazelle.com, uh, find the gadget, give the information, lock in that quote. They give you 30 days. They'll let you print out a shipping label. Sometimes they'll even send you a box. They did that for me. Uh, and, and not just because it's me. I mean, sometimes they'll just offer you the box. You send it off to them. As soon as they get it, they open it up. They send you emails, say, hey, we got your box. Okay, now we've opened it up and looked at it. Everything looks good. Your money's on your way, and they pay you fast uh, by PayPal or by check. So uh, there's really, it's risk-free for you to lock in a quote. There's no reason you shouldn't. If you're thinking about selling something, go try it out because it's hassle-free, it's easy, and you'll get some cash for the new gadgets. Try it out at gazelle.com. That's G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com. We thank Gazelle for their support of Tech News Today. Okie doke. YouTube finally changing their content ID appeal process. Remember back in December, uh, Tech News Today had an episode taken down off YouTube. We went through their process at the time. Here's what the new process is. The first half similar to the old one. There's that content ID program, that algorithm that identifies infringing video based on uh, it being uploaded by the copyright holder. Uh, the content owner uh, then decides whether to have it removed or monetize. They can actually just say, oh, we found matching content. We'll just put ads on it and give us the money. That's the end of it, right? Uh, however, they can also say, no, we want it removed. If it's removed, then the person who uploaded the video can choose whether to dispute the removal or not. That's all the way it used to be. Now here's what changes. The content owner has a choice to either release the claim and say, oh, you know what? Never mind. It was a mistake. That's fair use, or they have the right to that, or it was uh, the algorithm made a mistake. We're going to release that claim. Or they have to file a formal takedown notice under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And here's where the, this is where the difference was. Before, they could just say, nope, take it down. And there was no legal ramification because it was all an internal YouTube process. Now, they have to file a formal notice. The uploader then has a chance to file a formal counter notice under the DMCA. And the video stays up during this time. No, the content is actually not reposted for 10 days while the, after the okay. counter notice is filed. However, this is the, the difference. If it turns out that the content owner filed the takedown notice frivolously mm -hmm. or with knowledge that it was wrong, you can take them to court. And if you file a, for a formal counter notice, the video does have to be re re reinstated after the 10 days or they can take you to court. They, that's the only way they can get it pulled back down. 
So it brings in the courts into the situation and makes it a lot, there's a lot more of a burden on doing a takedown or doing a counter notice because you may end up having to defend yourself in court. And that that did not happen. And previously. if a content owner gets a video taken down where it's like, it seems like there just wasn't enough homework done because if they looked at the video, they clearly would see that, you know, it was under fair use or whatever, that would be deemed frivolous? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it, 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 dep it depends on the court, but you'd have to prove that they were abusing the system. It'd probably at least, at the very least, get content owners yeah. to pay a lot more attention to uh, to who they're going to go after because they don't want to go to court. I mean, a lot of... They're still going to get videos taken down that probably shouldn't get taken down because a lot of people go, I don't want to go to court. Forget it. You know, I'm guilty. Right. That kind of thing. But not everyone. I mean, right now, it's just a mess. It's a great small step from YouTube. I mean, we've, we had like this kind of cluster when we, we had this with Tech News Today. And I've had the same issue with music that I've got from Final Cut Pro. They're like loops that you buy and have a royalty to, I mean, a license to that is. I got taken down because somebody else had used it in something else. Yeah. I'm like, well, they yes, they have a copyright to that too, and me too, but you shouldn't be uh, taking down my things. This is that small step that won't make the content uh, providers freak out. People are like, you know, the, the big movie companies, and oh, yeah, well, yeah, sure, we'll. We can, we can abide by this little rule. We can do this little extra work. But I just wonder if this is one step in a long series of steps that Google's going to do with YouTube to make it a little bit more difficult and maybe very difficult to get content taken down again because YouTube reacted very quickly when they were getting hit by copyright concerns by doing this this whole like automatic takedown thing. But with, with court ramifications, it becomes a little bit more annoying to do this. So maybe we'll see more content stay up longer. Yeah, I, I, somebody in the chat room is like, how, anybody could take people to court. How is this new? The, the fact of the matter is, is the YouTube process was not part of the DMCA. So what you could take them to court for has changed. In the past, it was like, well, it's YouTube serves a service. So if they don't want to put it up, they could not put it up. So what would you take? The, you could take them to court, but what would you sue under? Now it's very clear to say, like, you are now operating under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Uh, and so there are clearer penalties for not following the process before if i was a content owner i'd just e easily say like yeah if i think it's mine i'm gonna i'm gonna have it taken down and i'm not gonna i'm gonna not gonna listen to appeals because i want to protect my content now i now you have to be more careful google for their part is going to alter the algorithm to produce fewer false positives they say uh and when uh something that looks like a false positive is triggered they're going to actually have human beings manually reviewing it now i find that to be a little questionable I mean, Martin, do you think that, that YouTube is now skating on the edge of their safe harbor by having people review this stuff? I mean, that's you know, it's a risky step, isn't it? Because you, you've sort of basically said, yes, we are now in the process of really vetting any of these kinds of, of situations. And you know, they could have you know, thousands, many, many, you know, many more than that. So it's going to require them to really put some resource behind it. And uh, may, maybe that's a decision that Google has taken, said, OK, look, you know, we just have no choice but to go down this route. But you know, it, it is the beginning of a slippery slope. If yeah, for sure. All right. Uh, Google also officially launching Google Wallet for web content. Yeah, when I read this headline, I'm like, what on earth does that mean? It's like a, it's like a new generation of paywalls. It's more like a, a toll on a bridge. Paywalls, the next generation. Exactly, exactly what we're looking at. So Google Wallet for web content works like this. If you're a, you know, a content consumer, you'd see an article preview, and you could click the Google Wallet button to purchase the rest of the content. So if, if you show this example of Google Wallet, you can just keep scrolling down, and you'll see this... this uh, this little bar will show up. It'll say, continue reading for 49 cents. Now, content will range in prices from 25 cents to 99 cents, and there's a 30-minute instant refund window. So if you're accidentally buying things, or you read really quickly, I guess, you could uh, just get a refund. Uh, content producers, though, if you like you know, having your content, this is one of the uh, partners. This is Peach Pit, if you're watching the video. You'll be able to embed a Google Wallet banner. Now, content after the free sample will appear, but it's all blurred out. However, Ads will still be visible alongside the pay, the, the pay content. So partners on board right now, we've got Oxford University Press, DK Publishing, and Peach Pit. So if you've got a lot of content and you want to make money on it, it seems like an interesting way to go. Well, what do we think of this micropayment system versus going with that flat out paywall, which we've seen on other newspapers? Mm, I kind of hate it. Uh, I, I, okay, so for example, I bought this like little mini book about cooking from Mark Bittman. It's like a little Kindle book for a couple of dollars. And it was like, ah, easy to buy. Now, it, you know, it's it's in my Kindle app on my iPad and I can read it. And yeah, I didn't have to think about it too much. I feel like 
if that was in an article form and I got through the first couple of pages of this book and then I was prompted to pay for the rest of it, you know, that wouldn't, I don't know, I, I don't have a real problem with that. But that's more of a book type of a thing, not an individual article type of a thing. And I don't like the idea of being nickeled and dimed article by article. You know, if you want to pay for the Wall Street Journal, for example, I don't. And so sometimes I get the articles in full and sometimes I don't. And when I don't, I find that story somewhere else. And I have the option to do that. But if you could, I mean, maybe 99 cents is a bad example. But if you could pay 10 cents to unlock the rest of that Wall Street Journal article, I mean, would that make a difference? No, because I, everyone writes the same the thing. So yeah. I just still find it somewhere else. But uh, I don't know. I just, I just. I hate this. I feel like there's just all these locks all over the place, potentially. And it just, I don't know. I don't like it. I think we're still we're still struggling to find the right kind of approach to micropayments uh, for for content. Um, you know, it, it, there is a risk that if you do sort of put all these little um, stop points all the way through, that people do become dis you know, disenchanted with your your offerings. But at the same time, you know, we've seen more and more uh, sort of models out there that give consumers choice. And at the end of the day, consumers do want to consume their content in lots of different ways. And if we as, a, as an industry and media can't come up with solutions that allow them to do that, we'll, we'll end up having the problem. So I, you, know, you have to listen to the customer. If that's really what the customer wants, then we have to find ways. I'm not particularly impressed by this Google Wallet approach, I have to say, but there are other models out there. It is funny to me that uh, we, we see people paying 99 cents for Kindle singles. Uh, or even full Kindle books. But mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of publications put long term articles that are up on the web for free uh, out as ebooks that people are paying for. Yeah. It's, it's all about the perception. When you're in a web browser, you expect it to be free. You don't expect to have to hit a Google Wallet button. And I think actually graying out the rest of the article sends the negative. Uh, response of like, aha, we're keeping something from you, and it plays into that. Like, no, the web, the web's just supposed to be there. Uh, even even though we might pay for the for the article itself for, for the exact same amount, if if we're in a different milieu, it it may sound irrational, but it's all about what we're used to, what we expect. Yeah. It's funny when I saw it all grayed out. I'm like, oh, there's a lot more content under there. Because oh, really? I don't want to see like when I see the Wall Street Journal things and like subscribe and you click this button and, and it's you find one it, more paragraph. There's like three words, and you're yeah. like, I paid money for that. At least you know that there's a lot in this content. And in the Peach Pit example, it's not necessarily news stories. This is about how to use Photoshop. So this is an article you will always have access to from now on. So it's, it could be for things that you want to keep on the web that you will never lose. I know that for things like Instructables.com, like I, I use that site all the time. But you could pay a monthly fee, and I don't use it that often. But I probably would go with the micropayment of, I'll pay 45 cents for that plan, or just to have it on one sheet or a PDF. But not for everything on Instructables, because I don't need to know how to do the arts and crafts stuff. I want to know how to solder today, that kind of thing. Well, and if I'm going to pay 99 cents for an article, then I don't want to see any ads on that page. Yeah. You know, for I mean, sure. it's one or the other, right? Information is free on the web because there's an ad supported model that works for a lot of companies. It's not really free. You just, no, yeah, you're you just, just, you either ignore it or you buy into it. And, you know, I was going to say everybody wins. I'm not sure if it's <laughs> equally they win, but it, it's a model that at least is working. And I understand that um, this idea is to try to figure out, okay, well, when ad supported uh, is not enough, yeah, at least for, for written content, then what do we do? But, it's it's you can't just lock up everything and then and make more money than you're, what you're making now or else people will move move to other forms of reading yeah uh, yeah and, and as martin as you said i mean we're, we're still struggling with what the right balance is for paywalls and what people will pay what they won't pay uh we will figure it out eventually and and it takes experiments like this i guess to kind of figure out what those things are so it's a good thing in the end uh, yeah, I guess it's a Google second half to the show today. Mm -hmm. uh, Google Glass wristwatch patent. Did I bag, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know I mean, what I'm saying? Yeah, this is a, 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 a patent that Google was issued from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office yesterday. For coffee? And no. There's it's, a lot of coffee in the background coffee, of the patent. Coffee, coffee. That's actually what's <laughs> on my brain right now. <laughs> this is just part of the illustration. Uh, it, uh, it's a watch. Um, it, people are saying, well, it looks like it. they could be hinting at something. It's a watch, and it's probably a wristwatch, unless it's an ankle watch or a neck watch or something. Um, a timepiece looks like it's got a clear touch screen that will flip up from the base 
of the watch to kind of give you a secondary display if it's open. So when it's closed, it's kind of like these hybrid tablets, right? You have one screen or you do a little flippy flip and then you've got two screens. Um, looks like from the images, um, and there is quite a bit of information in, in the patent filing that gives you an idea of what they're going for because again, the patent has been awarded so there's a lot of information that is open to the public. Images look like it would uh, include uh, directions, which would be great, you know, right on your wrist, product information, email notifications, the stuff that you would you would want um, that wouldn't necessarily be something that you'd need to wear Google glasses for or maybe that you wouldn't even want to. Um, and it's important to remember that just because a company gets a patent doesn't mean that there's a product oh, yeah. around the corner. And in fact, often it's almost the opposite of that. It's just kind of making sure that you're safeguarding yourself from someone else not, not um, rolling out a similar product with your great idea. But this is Google that we're talking about. And Google does crazy stuff like this. They've got freaking Google glasses right now that people are wearing. This seems absolutely around the corner. I to normally me. don't pay any attention to these patent filings because they are almost never meant for the product described to actually come out. They're mm -hmm. meant for all kinds of other reasons, like you said. But what struck me about this is I keep saying Google Glasses, but it's Google Glass, even though it's a pair mm -hmm. of glasses. And I've wondered why. This tells me why. Google Glass is going to be a technology they're going to put in lots of different places, not just in the glasses that you wear on your head. Yeah, exactly. You've got I, mean, I think glass is, you know, glass is the display. That's yeah. what we've got to remember. This is sort of miniaturized displays, and they will try and take those displays and put them wherever they can. And actually, this is this is a pattern that I would actually take quite seriously. I mean, whether the design actually works out this way, but, you know, you've got other watch companies out there, you know, Pebble, uh, Meta Watch, who are all trying to develop these sort of connected watches. Um, often they're sort of, uh, you know, have Bluetooth connections to your phone or whatever to get, to get that connectivity. But wearable computing is a massive trend coming up. And I think Google is, is trying to lead the charge, but you watch, you know, there'll be, uh, I'm sure an Apple Glass project and various other things before very long. And maybe there's an Apple wristwatch patent somewhere out there that we haven't yet picked up. This is a much easier to sell than put this on your face. You know, put it on your wrist. It's a yep. lot easier that way. You flip yep. it up and it seems a lot simpler. I mean, people are used to seeing that in like Dick Tracy in the old days. You could talk to your wristwatch. I've been into smart watches since spot watches and I get made fun of it for it. Microsoft <laughs> had this idea. You get sports scores on your watch. I'm like, this is brilliant. And then it died. Uh, but this is the kind of thing I want to use because I, I mean, I, I actually wear a wristwatch and I can just like look at things that way because I don't want to wear another set of glasses because I'm wearing it, these. It makes perfect sense to me too. It's like it's like a phone can be so many other things because you got to have the phone anyway. I mean, watches have sort of, I I mean, I haven't worn a watch for years because I can't figure out a good reason why I need one because I've got that phone and that's the whole clock and the whole thing. But my phone is not a part of me wearing it at all times. I love the idea of something smaller just being accessible, you know, wireless transmitting of the stuff that's important to me. And you could program it to get the kind of notifications that you want to be part of your watch and leave the, the rest of it for when you're at your computer or even when you're on your mobile device. And I mean, remember that the before the, the latest generation of the iPod Nanos, they looked like little watches. We all thought, oh, okay, well, that's what iPod Nanos are now. Yeah, right. So what's Apple doing? I mean, there's almost no reason to pull something that people thought was pretty cool. Are they working on some sort of wearable display and, and breaking, breaking that out from the iPod Nano line? Possibly. But it seems pretty obvious that Google's going to come out with something too. Our chat room, uh, I think, has hit on it. The monocle. Yeah. <laughs> you just pop it out, yeah. fancy that minute, and put it back. Yeah, oh, you I just like key out. That's true. You could have the monocle uh, pull off yeah. of your of your watch. I like it. Straight out of David Wait, yep. Brin's book, yep. Existence. Yep. Yeah. Trouble. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's uh, move on to the randomizer. Get you guys a cheap phone. Randomizer. If you live in L.A. or New York, uh, look for certain versions of Entertainment Weekly's print ad uh, for the CW. Because it's got a little LCD display that live tweets and video appear on. Of course, geeks everywhere said, how is that happening? Ripped open the page and found an actual Android phone <laughs> embedded in the advertisement. Yeah. Uh, it's the internals of it, obviously, but it has a keyboard on it that, that you, could, you can kind of gain access to. And uh, Mashable was actually able to make a call yeah, using all, it. All yeah, it has a T-Mobile SIM card in it. All kinds of, you know, you can't seal that up. It's in a magazine, right? It's not like it has, like, pentalobe screws or anything screwball oh, right, screw yeah. that way. You rip it open, and there's a phone in there 
they're giving away with the magazine. I'm just shocked at how, like, I know it's only a thousand copies, but like, that's this is an eighty-three dollar device. Normally, it has a, a functioning go. keyboard. <laughs> if you mess with it, I was just, just, I don't know. We're like we're living in the future. If, if our magazines have Android phones built into them with apps. Because I've know. got a golden Android. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky you. Now you will have to put put it in your own case. Does that does that uh, obviate the uh, <laughs> or walk around oh, with a magazine a people, every day? Or is this cooler? People love that idea. You just have to memorize yeah. QWERTY well, too because you don't see the keys that you Personalization. It's yeah. great. <laughs> exactly. Hey, almost free phone. What I are you gonna got do? A golden Android in my mag. <laughs> In my CW ad. Uh, that was actually one of my favorite tweets from last night. You know who the real loser in the debate was? The season premiere of Supernatural on the CW. Because nobody watched Which it. Which was, Everybody oh, was I watching see. the debate instead. Mm -hmm. uh, this episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Ring Central. When we built the studio here at Twit, uh, one of the things we wanted to do was put as much stuff in the cloud as possible. We, we had need for a phone system now. We weren't just stuck in this little cottage where we could, we could all share a phone. Uh, and Russell said, look, don't put an old PBX system in the basement. And Leo's like, I absolutely have no intention of rolling a big PBX system in the basement. What do I do? He said, get a cloud-based phone system. Ring Central was a no-brainer. Uh, zero startup costs, no hardware to install or maintain, easily customizable. You can get your voicemail. And if people insist on sending you faxes in this day and age, which they still do, you can get those in your email as well. Uh, it's all easy to use, and it works just like a phone when you need it to. Ring Central offers all-inclusive pricing as low as $20 a month per user, and you can start right now with a 30-day free trial. They have a special offer for listeners of Tech News Today as well. Our listeners can buy one phone and get a second one phone, phone free up to 20 phones. So call this number. Uh, this is the number for Tech News Today listeners, for Twit listeners, 800-543-9980. That's 800 800- Nine five four three nine nine eight zero. I almost said it wrong, so let me say it again. Eight hundred five four three nine nine eight zero. Or you can also go to ringcentral.com and use the promo code TWIT. Uh, it's I've got a I've got a Ring Central phone right here in my hands, right here on my desk. Use it all the time. So thin, so light. Yeah, easy to charge. Check it out, ringcentral.com. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. What's on the calendar, Sarah? Glad you asked, Tom. The Free Software Foundation was founded on this day in 1985 by Richard Stallman. Uh, used to be a guest on the Screensavers back in the day. Oh, yeah. He's, yeah. Still, he's still kicking. He's oh, yeah. still out there. Yeah, absolutely. The LG Optimus G is arriving on AT&T and Sprint later this year. No firm release date, but before December 31st, one assumes. And the Acer Iconia W700 Windows 8 tablet is launching on October 26th for $799 and 99 cents. Lots of tablets coming. Along with Windows 8 on October Tablet 26th. year. The Microsoft pop-up store in Corte Madera isn't open until November 1st. That means I might have Windows phones. Like, no Windows 8 party there. What's well, up with that? What the heck? It's I not even know. a week later, but... All right. Let's it's see what's Corte incoming. Madera. Incoming message. Got an email from Handy Andy in Atlanta, back again. Uh, says, I am following the Metro PCS T-Mobile merger with interest as my family's on a T-Mobile plan. Another reason for the deal... Could be that the deal structures are usually driven by financial and tax considerations. In this case, it most likely has to do with the fact that Metro PCS is already a New York Stock Exchange traded public company. The press release says it. Upon consummation of the transaction, the combined company is expected to continue trading on the New York Stock Exchange. If Deutsche Telekom had acquired Metro PCS outright, it would have had to buy out the Metro PCS shareholders and then combine the two companies. We, we kind of talked through some of this yesterday. Uh, but what Handy Andy points out is, with a consolidation of this type, T-Mobile becomes publicly traded without going through an expensive IPO. This gives them more financial flexibility, and it probably has significant tax benefits as well. Yeah, it was yeah. So it also it also it's a really interesting structure because I think the the parent company Deutsche Telekom, which owns T-Mobile USA, you know, has been looking for a way to try and sort of reduce its exposure to to United States. You know, it's a very competitive market here. I don't think they quite made the money that they'd hoped to, but they didn't want to sort of get out altogether. And this enables them effectively to get a, a listing. They'll get seventy four percent of the company, and then they can sell down their stake or at least part of it. After I guess there must be some lockups in there, but ultimately they can get down without having to dump the whole thing. Yesterday I was listening to the show in my car. I'm like, tax reasons. I'm talking back to the radio because I wasn't, I wasn't here. Andy Andy was I'm like, like you, Thank you, Andy, Andy. He actually he said in his email that we did a pretty good job without IAS here to help us, but uh, he <laughs> filled in the gaps. 
Next email from Jerry. Jerry says, everybody has decided to call this unicorn the iPad mini. I suggest an alternative. The iBook, a scaled-down iPad with a focus on eBooks, music, and video. I would put the price at or near the mid-range Kindle. If Apple actually makes this smaller tablet, I think the goal would be to ease the way into the Apple ecosystem. At first, I went, you can't do that. iBook already exists. I see people using iBooks at Still? cafes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, that, talk about confusing. But yeah. it is a really good name. And it probably is going to be the direction that the iPad mini um, it will will go in when people say, well, which I already have a full a full iPad. Why would I need an iPad mini? Or I don't have one at all. Why would I choose the smaller one? The it's a little iPad bit more of a, shuffle. It yeah. will just randomly Whatever. give you a book. <laughs> or randomly give you pages from many from books. Many different books. <laughs> right, they, they already used iBooks for their bookstore, didn't they? So they're, they're already using that. They keep using iBooks, yeah. So I don't no reason to stop now. Not. Yeah, but if you have an iBook, that's where you read iBooks. Uh, Aha. Ah, I just blew your mind, Akhtar. Yes, my mind has been blown. I have to read this email from Kevin, though, because my mind is still here. Hey, TNT crew, love the show. I listen every day. I have one clarification for you. The Locatron does not support NFC like it was presented. According to their website, Locatron will ship you an NFC token, if there's enough interest, that will trigger their app to open your door. Seems like a buzzword feature ad to me. I'm still excited to see more on this unit and hope it works as well as they say. I don't know that we presented it as using NFC in any way different. We just said it had NFC support, which it does. But it's good to know that it's not actually built into the box itself. It's just a sticker token, uh, which could be ripped off your door, I would think. <laughs> right? Another sticker above says, do not remove the lower sticker. <laughs> Dear thieves, just break <laughs> in the door. Don't remove the sticker. That would be annoying. All right. Uh, well, thanks, Kevin. Appreciate that. And uh, thank you for being in the chat room as Sky Geek. That's it for this episode of Tech News Today. Thanks, everybody, also for participating in our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. Helps us figure out what stories we want to talk about. That's where we got our randomizer about that smartphone hidden inside Entertainment Weekly uh, from, from our subreddit. So go join in and vote on the stories you'd like to hear us talk about. Uh, we do consider when we make our lineup every day, technewstoday.reddit.com. Martin Giles, thank you, sir, uh, once again for joining us. It's always a pleasure. Pleasure as always. Uh, let folks know where they can follow you and, and find your work online. It's uh, um, at Martin Giles on Twitter and obviously economist.com backslash Babbage, B-A-B-B-A-G-E. It's our and, tech blog. And you can find your, your work in print as well, right? Yes, you can. It's It'll have the San Francisco dateline because we don't sign our articles, as I you know. know you but don't. anything coming out of San Francisco, it's probably me. Is that right? Okay, I'll keep an eye out for that from now on because I am a subscriber. Well, that's it for this episode of uh, Tech News Today. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us. Our email address is tnt at twit.tv. And give us a call. Leave us a voicemail. Our number is 260-TNT-SHOW. We'll wrap up the week tomorrow with Darren Kitchen. See you then.